evening, everyone. Family, friends, respected guests. Glad you could all make it this evening. We've had a, an enjoyable day so far. Um, I'd just like to welcome you to the to the first of, of three evening Bible presentations. And this evening we're going to be talking about hell. Um, we're going to touch on, touch on some popular misconceptions of hell, why and where these ideas stem from, and uh, then we'll see if any of them actually hold water when compared to the actual teachings of the Bible. Uh, and finally, we'll end the Bible's promise of hope in contrast to the finality of, of hell. Technical difficulties here. There we go, thank you. <clears throat> so we'll uh, just discuss some, some of the more popular views of hell. Then we'll establish what the Bible teaches of our nature, uh, and also what happens to us when we die. We'll reveal the old, original Old Testament word, translated uh, hell. We'll expound upon the original New Testament words that are also translated hell. And finally, we'll con confirm man's one true hope, offered by all, to all by God, revealed to us through His Holy Word and Bible. Uh, so often, uh, we try to take the reality of, uh, we avoid taking the reality of death seriously. I think it's pretty safe to say uh, that the majority of people in the world spend very little time thinking about death, or their nature for that matter. In the, the Western world, it's probably compounded by the fact we're pretty sheltered from death overall. That is, from things like war, famine, uh, and a lack of this self-examination, I think, leads to people drifting through life, making decisions which only satisfy their desires in the short term. But God wants men and women to understand their frailty and to look for answers. Moses recognized this, and he said to God, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Men and women's response to death has been quite varied, hasn't it? Ideas about life after death probably existed in every culture throughout history. And death being the most fundamental problem of human existence, it's not surprising that man has always been looking to find ways to lessen the impact. Remember that the very first lie we find in the Bible is about this very thing. The serpent said to Eve, Thou shalt not surely die. And from this point on, uh, people have always tried to find ways to somehow downplay the finality of death find more comfortable ideas to believe in. Ever since the, the first man and woman, we've had a whole range of, of false theories that have been created about death and about the nature of man. A number of Christian denominations <clears throat> since that point have concluded men and women have an immortal soul. Some element of immortality inside of them which survives death and goes on either to some place of reward, or else punishment. And this place of, of punishment has been termed hell. Now there seems to be quite varied ideas about what hell actually is, even between those who believe in an immortal soul. The traditional view is that hell is a place of, of fiery torment for condemned souls, a place of eternal punishment for the wicked after death. And apparently it's, it's presided over by some supernatural devil called Satan. And another less well-known view is that Satan and his fallen angels have been put in hell by God. And that God somehow is actually in control of hell. But in more recent times, I think people have begun to abandon these ideas. I think mainly because they found the idea of eternal suffering in hell so difficult to stomach. This has led to a whole new load of ideas, such as hell being 
nothing more than a state of mind, or perhaps beliefs, such as, as universal salvation. And that we understand too, is the idea that everyone will experience eternal life, irrespective of how they behave during their lives. That sounds pretty good then. Uh, but this, of course, has left people feeling quite uneasy. Because that suggests that there's no true justice. And the whole idea just doesn't square with the character of God as the true righteous judge. Well, the Christadelphians do not share any of these views or any of the traditional views of hell either. And I hope this evening we're able to, dis to discover uh, the true meaning of hell as revealed in the Bible. And we'll also see that this won't leave us with <coughs> uneasy feelings about justice, but that it doesn't square with all parts of the Bible. So as I mentioned, the idea of hell being a place of punishment for the wicked uh, has really grown out of another belief, that of the immortality of the soul. But did you know that the words immortal and soul cannot be found consecutively in the Bible? Let me think about it. Going to heaven or hell is just a logical extension from this belief that some part of you is immortal. Because when you die, it has to go somewhere, right? But before we look at how hell is used in the Bible, I think we need to establish what the Bible teaches us about our nature and exactly what happens to us when we die. We'll first start by looking at Genesis Chapter 2. And here we read about the creation of man on the sixth day. In Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God bore man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. So God made man of the dust of the ground, brought him to life, and then of course he makes Eve in one of Adam's ribs. We know how they were then tempted by the serpent to eat the fruit that God commanded them not to eat. God says at the end of verse 17, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, <clears throat> thou shalt surely die. Then we find that God judges them for their sin in chapter 3 and verse 17. Here we read, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns, thistles, shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt, shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it must thou take him, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. <clears throat> so God makes it very clear here what he, exactly he meant about death. It was going to be, in effect, a reversal of Adam's creation. God formed Adam <clears throat> from the dust, gave him the breath of life. Now death was going to be taking away of that breath, and his body simply returning to the ground. Notice there's no mention of the concept of eternal torment. And there's no hint that any part of Adam would continue to, to live on after he died. So the Bible is very clear throughout that death is the end of our consciousness. Just listen to these words from Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know that they must die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And in Psalms, we also read, His breath goeth forth, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Now I realize this was a quite a long introduction before we even looked at any references to hell. But I think it's it's pretty important to establish some fundamental points about human nature and what happens to us when we die. That is the end of our consciousness. There is no mention 
many part of us that continues living after death. So, first of all, we're going to begin by eliminating a problem that the King James Version, in particular, has introduced. And this is the way in which four different words have all been translated as the word of oh. Just before we do that, though, think about this for a minute. The word heaven appears in the King James Version of the Bible a total of 583 times for heaven. Now, if, if hell is the punishment for failing to repent and accept Jesus as our Savior, then how often do you suppose that God would have uh, warned us about this in the Bible? Perhaps a thousand times? Probably at least as many as, as times as the word heaven is used. Well, in fact, the, the word hell only appears 54 times throughout the King James Version. So something already doesn't feel right to balance there. Just as there is no mention of, of the punishment of eternal torment when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the same is also true of a number of key events early on in, in Scripture, such as Cain and Abel, Noah and the Flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and so on. And all of these you would think would be perfect opportunities, really, for, for God to explain just what happens to the wicked when they die. So, so to start with, I want to focus on the Old Testament, which was originally written in the Hebrew. In the Old Testament, all the references to the word hell have been used when the original Hebrew word was sheol. This word sheol simply means the grave or the pit. When they were translating the King James Version of the Bible, the translators have used the word hell and the grave 31 times each for the same word sheol. Here on the screen, we see a concordance. I'm sure most of you have probably used it once, if not many times. But for those of you who haven't, it's simply a book that shows all the original translations for every word in our English Bibles. It shows the Hebrew translations for all, all words in the Old Testament, and also the Greek translations for the words in the New Testament. And this was the essential tool I used to identify all the original words that were translated as the word hell in our modern Bibles. And I just put an example up here. You see the word. I don't know if you can see it or not, but up here we have the word hell. And it has every single um, instance where the word hell is used in the Bible, beginning from Genesis uh, through, through Revelation there. And you just find your reference, and uh, you pick out your index number, flip to the back, and uh, on the bottom we can see find the corresponding number, and find out the original word that was used. So, uh, I'll turn up Genesis chapter 37. And here we see an occasion uh, where the translators have chosen to translate Sheol as the grave and not hell. This was when Joseph's brothers uh, just sold him to the Ishmaelites. They took his coat, dipped it in goat's blood, uh, to give their father the impression he, he had been killed by a wild animal. <coughs> we find his reaction recorded in verse 34. It says, and Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son and mourn. Thus his father wept for him. The word grave here is the same word which has been translated hell elsewhere. Did Jacob really mean? He's going to go to hell, a place of eternal suffering? Or did he simply mean he would mourn for his son until the day he died? Now we'll turn to the 49th Psalm. And we'll see another example where the traditional view of hell just doesn't quite seem to fit. Uh, psalm 49, which, which is a psalm of David. And in verse 15, he says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. 
for he shall receive me. So the belief that hell is a place of eternal punishment for the wicked, from which they cannot escape, just doesn't fit with this. A righteous man can go to hell, the grave, and then come out again. There are many other references to, to people coming out of the grave. Or uh, God speaking about his people in Hosea. It says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And also some words from Hannah's prayer are very clear. Where she says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. In both these references, the word grave is this same word shield, which has been translated hell. But these are not referring to a place of eternal punishment for the wicked, because we have righteous people going there. And it's possible for people to come out or to leave. So clearly what David is saying is that he will be resurrected by God from the grave. For we know that this is the plan and purpose of God at the return of Jesus, that the righteous will be raised to eternal life. And if you will, let's take a look at the book of Jonah. And we're all looking at an example here where the word Sheol has been translated as hell. So we find Jonah in the belly of the fish, and he realizes the error of his ways, that he shouldn't have tried to run away from the work that God had commissioned him to do. Chapter 2 <laughs> We see his response. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardst my voice. I'll ask you all to remember this, this quotation here as we referring to it again shortly. So Jonah's not really saying that he was in hell for three days, but rather he's using the word hell to describe the belly of the fish, he's saying. Being in the belly of, of the fish is like being in a living grave to Jonah. No doubt he thought he might die, and he was as good as dead. But after three days and three nights, when the fish vomited him from its mouth, from the belly of hell, as Jonah refers to it, we know that this pointed forward the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. You can also see the parallel of both Jonah and Christ being in hell for three days. And upon further investigation of the study of hell and, and how the Hebrew word Sheol ties in with it, I discovered that Sheol actually is a place. It does exist. It's actually the, the name of a street as well as a mountain in Durango, Colorado both of which have quite a cooler climate than a popular Mystic Sea location. Um, you might be wondering why the translators chose to use this word hell in some places for the word shield. Where did it come from? Well, it seems to have come from an old Anglo-Saxon word, which means to cover or conceal. And it's where you get words like helmet from. So of course we know it's the covering for your head. So it didn't originally mean a place of, of torment in the English either. But since then, it seems to have taken on uh, all kinds of pagan meanings and ideas, which seem to go back to cultures as far back as the Egyptians. The Egyptians, of course, believed in a mortal soul, and that this soul would go on to, to an afterlife. They would carefully preserve their dead and bury them with everything they might need for this, this kind of afterlife. Anyway, so somehow through all kinds of pagan mythology, and in particular the teachings of the, the Catholic Church, the meaning has changed to mean a, a place of fiery torment for the souls of the wicked. So it's, it's really unclear to me if the translators meant for the word to mean to cover or conceal, which would have been an okay translation, or if they added it because they had preconceived ideas about this place of eternal torment. But whatever the reason, it's it's still clear that hell is really not a good translation at all. And the use of this word hell has decreased rapidly in, in more modern translations of the Bible. 
The translators, I believe, realized that this Hebrew word sheol uh, simply meant a grave. <coughs> the original spider of the Bible. And I found a list of the more popular translations of the Bible in use today. Of these, the King James and the New King James versions are the only two translations to use the word hell in the Old Testament. All the other translations replace the word hell with other words. Words such as the grave, pit, or simply death. And in some cases, they've just left the original word sheol in the text. And if you have a more modern version of the Bible in front of you now, uh, you'll probably find that's the case in Jonah. So we'll just quickly look at a couple examples here. First we'll look at the English Standard Version. Jonah chapter 2, first couple of verses here. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and he heard my voice. Next we'll have a look at the English, or sorry, New Living Translation. Same passage. Uh, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and the Lord you heard me. Finally, we'll look at uh, Jonah chapter 2 again. Through the eyes of the Good News Bible. In this version we read, from deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, O Lord, I called to you, and you answered me. From deep in the world of the dead, I cried for help, and you heard me. So we can see from this uh, simple comparison of, of one word in, in three or four different versions of the Bible, how easily one can, can be led astray by taking a single verse at face value, or out of context with the rest of the, the Bible. It might also shed some insight as to why there are thousands of religions in existence today. So moving on to the New Testament, hell here has been translated from three different Greek words. Hades, Gehenna, and Tartar. I'm not sure if those are the right pronunciations, but for intents and purposes, they'll work. And for time's sake, we're only going to look at, at uh, the first two this evening, being Hades and, and Gehenna. Uh, the word Tartar there at the bottom is only found once in the whole of the New Testament. It's actually quite closely related to the first anyhow. So, <coughs> so this word Hades, um, it's been used 11 times in the New Testament, King James Version. And it's translated 10 times as hell and once as the Greek. Hades is a Greek word, which just means unseen. But it can be read as the equivalent Hebrew word, Sheol. We know this because a number of New Testament passages which quote the Old Testament. Let's look at one, shall we? Uh, come with me now to Acts chapter 2. Here, uh, Peter is speaking to the multitudes on the day of Pentecost about Jesus as he is quoting some words of David in the Psalms. Uh, chapter 2, verse 25. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my flesh shall rest than hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. So these few verses are direct quote from Psalm 16. We see they're talking about how Jesus died and went to the grave. The word we find in Psalm 16, translated as hell, is Sheol. And here in Acts, it's uh, Hades. So if we can accept those words in Psalm 16, to mean that Jesus went to the grave when he died, not hell. It makes sense to accept what Peter meant here in Acts chapter 2. And we can see from the context here, uh, the same chapter, uh, that is what Peter intended. 
He's speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. He goes on to explain how that David had seen this as a prophecy from God. And, and if you just look at verse 31, uh, speaking of David, it says, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in him, neither did his flesh see corruption. Just scroll back with me at Mark chapter 9. I want to look at the second word translated hell in the New Testament, and that's the word Gehenna. And the King James Version translated 12 times this word. Mark chapter 9, verse, verse 43. This is Jesus speaking. He says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed that having two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And then Jesus repeats himself with, If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. Then in verse 47, If thine eye offend thee, then pluck it out. So the word Gehenna here, which has been translated hell, is the only word all once translated hell that has anything at all to do with fire. And this is due to the fact that this was the name of a valley just outside Jerusalem, to the southwest corner, which at the time of Jesus was nothing more than the city garbage dump. And in order to control this ever-growing, rotting pile of garbage, it was kept burning continually. So everything would have been thrown in here, including dead animals, bodies of criminals, after they had been executed. So, Gehenna became symbolic. Total destruction and rejection. And the crowds of those days, hearing Jesus, would have understood this use he made of Gehenna, and certainly wouldn't have seen Christ as referring to a place of eternal fiery torment. The references to eternal fire and the worms that never die there represent the nature of God's judgment against sin. The eternal destruction of sin is through death. Here we have a map of Gehenna, or the Hinnom Valley is also called uh, New Testament times. Kind of hard to see, but again, it's in the, the bottom left-hand corner of the uh, map here. Next we have a uh, picture of Gehenna from 1900. And then this is a, a more modern, modern-day Gehenna. It's pretty, pretty desolate there. Um, we know that God's judgment is often described as, as a fire that doesn't go out. Like uh, this example from Ezekiel. Here we read, And say to the forest, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and I shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming fire shall not be quenched. All the places from the south to the north shall be burned therein. So as a proper noun, the name of a place, Gehenna really should have been left untranslated. So now we've looked at all four words meaning hell, or related to it, just three out of four as the last one was similar to Hades. And we've seen that hell, being a place of eternal torment, just doesn't fit with the original meaning rendered in the scriptures. So what does actually happen to us? Do we return to the dust at the end? Well, it's established that God's punishment for the wicked is exactly this. No part of them continues to exist and is tormented forever. They will simply lose all consciousness and return to the ground. Speaking of God's punishment against his enemies, uh, God says, they are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. All their memories perish. So the final punishment of the wicked is perpetual death. 
That fits in with what we understand from the scriptures about sin and its consequences. Beginning with Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, we are told the wages of sin is death. So at this point, it's looking rather bleak, isn't it? We just end up in the ground, and what hope do we have? We're told throughout the Bible that for those judged righteous, their inheritance will be the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. And he also taught his disciples to pray, didn't he? Most of you probably know, heard the Lord's Prayer many times. It goes as follows. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we know that all men and women will, will die uh, due to the nature we inherit from Adam. And we've learned that there is no consciousness in death. So the only way, therefore, for the righteous to receive their reward is to be brought to life again by resurrection from the dead. Let's turn up 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In this chapter, uh, Paul talks at length about the resurrection, showing that it is the center of our hope. Paul had encountered people doubting his teaching on the resurrection, and this was his challenge to them in verse 16. He says, For if the dead rise not, then Christ then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So if the doctrine of the immortality of the soul were true, then there would be no need of the resurrection of the body. Resurrection would be useless if a part of us had continued to live on after we died and went to another heaven or hell. Yet we have Paul here saying that if there's no resurrection, our faith is meaningless and empty. Paul continues in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's and his coming. So the fact that Christ is raised from the dead makes our faith meaningful. And it's, the, and it's only through resurrection that we will have life after death. <clears throat> Jesus was raised and is the first of the believers, like many believers, to come by his return to the earth to live again. And this is exactly what Jesus came to do. Listen to these words from John. He says, is the Father's will which hath sent me, and of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. So those who are responsible at the return of Jesus will be raised and judged. Those who are judged righteous will be given immortal life and granted the privilege of serving God throughout eternity. This immortality, of course, isn't something that we already possess, as we've established, but it's simply a gift to be given at God's mercy. Paul describes that moment for us in verse 53 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this incorruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Verse 55 here is a quote from Hosea. And in Hosea, the word sheol is translated as grave. Here in 1 Corinthians, the word Hades is used. 
And so here you have another example of how those two words translated how can be used interchangeably between the Old and New Testaments. Paul is describing here the moment when our mortal bodies will be changed and the curse of death, which is inherent in our nature from Adam, will then no longer have power on us. Just come with me over to Revelation chapter 20. You'll be familiar with this. We just read it yesterday. And speaking of the judgment, when, when the dead will be raised to stand before Jesus. Revelation 20, verses 13 to 14. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. sense to throw it into the lake of fire, does it? But rather if we read hell as the grave or death, then we have a description here of that final moment when there will be no more mortal people on the earth and Jesus, the saints, will live forever. So then central to the purpose of God is the second coming of Jesus when he'll overthrow the kingdoms of men and set up God's kingdom on this earth. So how can we be a part of this great hope? Well, Jesus tells us in the 25th chapter of John's Gospel, um, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So our response needs to be a belief in Jesus, or more specifically, understanding what Jesus has done for us, how that he laid down his life for us, we might have our sins forgiven. Jesus is described in Hebrews as the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So as well as believing, we have to work in our lives to try and follow the example of Christ and live lives, <coughs> developing a, a character that is pleasing to God. And so this evening we've looked at, at a number of words which have been translated help. And hopefully we've seen that if we read these references as simply referring to the grave, or in some cases the canons continually burning refuse, no? Then our understanding what death is, what happens to us when we die, fits in the rest of what we understand the Bible teaches. And as far as ideas about hell being a place of fiery torment are not, in fact, what the Bible teaches. Nor does it make sense for followers of Christ to believe such things. And it would make the death of Jesus, his resurrection, meaningless, as Paul had explained to us. It's a great shame, really, that this has been and continues to be a stumbling point to true teaching, as it has no foundation whatsoever in the world. We are mortal because of our disobedience, and ultimately, because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Without the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, God's grace and mercy, we will all die, go to hell, or rather the grave, and remain there. So our great hope, then, is to be raised at the coming of Jesus, if we pray, we'll be very soon.